Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to a brand new episode of Perspectives on Global Justice, Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. My mother used to tell me that women are born majestic by the simple virtue of being born a woman. So, I am of the opinion that we all should honor and celebrate women every day. March 8th was the International Women's Day across the globe. And in 2018, more women are uniting on a women's global movement for women's rights, equality, justice, and the right of women in political representation. And we are seeing global marches and campaigns, including the Me Too and the Time is Up movement in the United States and in other countries. This year, the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women drew attention to the rights and act activism of rural women who make up over a quarter of the world's population. They have been fighting for women's rights and gender equality for a long time, yet they have been left behind in every measure of development across the globe. Today, we are honored by the presence of guest Kara Jabula Karulus. We will have a conversation about women's issues in the state of Hawaii, and about the formation and activities of Hawaii State Commission on Status of Women. We'll also discuss vision and vision, uh, vision and mission of uh, uh, this wonderful uh, commission and their very important role in all pro-women and pro-family legislation in the state of Hawaii. And uh, we will have also time to talk about Title IX and other legislations that are on the legislative floor right now and the Me Too reaction and response in our state, as well as the Me Too prevention training to challenge male inequality in the workplace in the state of Hawaii. On that note, welcome to our program. Mahalo, thank you for having me. Thank you. So to our viewers, um, would you mind giving a little background about, uh, you know, where are you coming from and uh, where are you at right now in this process? So I am here on behalf of the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women, which was created by executive order in 1964, so progeny of what the so-called second wave of feminism. And it's the agency, state agency, charged with being a watchdog for women and girls across Hawaii and also a central resource place. So we lead um, on legislative advocacy in coordination with com women's community leaders. And uh, so you're talking about the formation um, of the commission, and can you give our viewers a little perspective of what the bumps in the roads and the accomplishments have been like uh, since its inception? Uh, sure. So the commission has led the way on a number of key pieces of legislation. Most recent, one of the biggest ones, most controversially, was access to emergency contraception for rape victims. Um, that was a huge victory. Um, but through the years, it hasn't just been about legislation, but also providing data and benchmarks for women in the state and recording our progress. So this has been women's collective progress. And one of the biggest functions for us is making sure that women have a place to go, that they know they will be believed and protected and fought for. Right. Well, this is so important. And uh, um, I know that it's 2018, and I think globally all women have this sentiment that it's beyond past the time that we have uh, uh, these uh, safety measurements in place. And data is such an important aspect of it. Uh, like, how do we know what the problems are, and how do we measure progress, and how do we learn about where we're at if we don't have that? Uh, but also, I think the part of funding for, you know, um, commissions to be able to exist and to be active, where has Hawaii been in this aspect? Well, funding is a statement of values, right? So. I think that the Commission on the Status of Women could most definitely use some more fiscal support from the state in order to fulfill our mandate and what women and girls deserve. 
I think that we have really strong women's leadership in our state legislature as well as in our congressional delegation. This is a really positive thing for Hawaii that a lot of other jurisdictions can't boast. Um, and we want that translated, though, to this agency. So I think that we still have a ways to go in terms of institutionalizing our value of women and our respect for women and where we need to get mm -hmm. them. Right, so the commission really uh, covers uh, all of the islands of Hawaii, so the entire state of Hawaii. Yeah, so we have county commissions um, for each county, and it's really great to be able to have that presence. I know I'm by island, so um, I also live in Kihei, and it's really important to have that other perspective rather than just a completely uh, Oahu-centric focus, mm -hmm. because the issues are so different. Um, particularly in more rural areas. Right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, women's issues in Hawaii. And uh, you were able to make a beautiful distinction between uh, issues of more urban area versus rural areas. There are obviously different needs and different issues. So would you tell us a little bit of what you've noticed? Um, one, of, one of the biggest problems has been access to certain uh, services relating to reproductive health and reproductive justice. And I know that we might have some really great laws relative to other states that we've enshrined and are protecting here in Hawaii, but it doesn't mean anything if women can't access those services because the logistics aren't in place for them. So that's one of the key issues for women on Kauai, women on Hawaii Island, uh, relative to Oahu and Maui, even. So what, what is missing for these key legislation pieces to be implemented? Because we have the, the laws, so what is the next step to make it happen? Well, one of the things that I think people don't realize is all of the work that goes on behind the scenes to pass bold pro-women legislation every year. <laughs> um, so there's a package, actually, that the Women's Coalition, which is all of the different women's advocates, anyone can join, can come to the table. There's no government involved except for um, my position in, in kind of coordinating it all. And we create a package that we work with um, the Women's Legislative Caucus. They have their own. Um, and introduce it at the very beginning of session together and prepare. Um, but to your question, what else needs to be in place since we do have these w women working so hard, is I think one of the biggest obstacles can actually be government itself. I think that certain government agencies want to avoid or limit liability to themselves, even when they're participating in civil rights violations. And um, one of the biggest challenges is their method of lobbying. I think it's really difficult to um, be able to have open discussions and push and pass legislation if things aren't happening in a transparent way. So I know that's one challenge. So how would you uh, hope that the commission will move forward in this process to help uh, lobbying to be more balanced and for transparency in communication uh, when discussions need to occur um, to actually start happening? Because uh, that really puts you know, a stop in, I think, any process. So identifying that is a first step in, in recognizing, but then we know we have a challenge. And so what are your suggestions you know, to make this whole brand new chapter in reality moving forward? <laughs> well, I'm excited to be at the commission because I get to be in government and I get to liaise with people who are going to be my colleagues, who are my peers within the system. Um, so be able to you know, use my power relative in this position to, to push actors to be more accountable. Um, on the other hand, though, it doesn't start and end with government at all. It needs to really start with activism and the community. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have a duty to support community groups and community voices mm -hmm. and to be fully accessible mm -hmm. to those voices mm -hmm. and responsive. Right. So, uh, you know, you touched on a very uh, core 
you know, peace for Hawaii, and I think across the nation, but especially in Hawaii, which, yes, is the work with uh, our representatives, but also the work with the community in terms of supporting grassroots uh, organizing and activism, uh, but also that part that they can be heard, and uh, also making it accessible, not just for folks who are in Honolulu, because like, I always, it seems to me, I always ends up being, you know, a movement that's driven and, and you know, I always highlighted in Honolulu. And I know that we have other islands and amazing women who are working so hard. So, like, what is the vision to make sure that this work is done in a, in a spirit of unity and that that, that space and that room on the table is available to all. Well, we can talk about legislation and how to get people more involved with the mm -hmm. state legislature, which unfortunately is on Oahu and requires um, really intensive care mm -hmm. when you want to champion something through during this mm -hmm. January through May. Um, but there's also stuff that can be done at the county level. For example, Maui just um, enshrined the principles of CEDAW the International Bill of Rights for Women mm -hmm. at the county level. Mm -hmm. So you can engage local government there, but it's not just about legislation. And I no. think we put way too much focus on legislation and have mm -hmm. underestimated institutionalized social norms um, in, in, in our neighborhoods and in our communities. Mm -hmm. So I think to engage people outside of Oahu, the commission um, just needs to continue to work with its county commissions and also mm -hmm. have a, a listening process mm -hmm. for different community groups that are active on the ground because nothing can substitute that and nothing's more valuable than that because if we're not responding to what the community needs, then we're not doing our job. Right. And uh, there is also a big difference, I think, in terms of uh, community voices of women in different parts of Hawaii. Uh, not only, you know, in terms of uh, gen um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, ethnic uh, background, uh, but also values and beliefs. And uh, uh, I really am excited that uh, the commission has this commitment to make sure that all voices are heard and acknowledged. It's, uh, it's hard work, uh, and, uh, and I think it's very needed. It's, it's past the time. <laughs> it is. I was just on Maui during that CEDA hearing, and what I did um, is I spent a day with Latina women organizers who are part of a community that we have a really difficult time hearing, I think. Mm -hmm. And they had a rally around um, International Women's Day, and then we sat down together to do a training on uh, the gender system and all the different problems that we're facing because of that that are further um, burdensome because of issues of citizenship and language access and race and not having class privilege. So um, I, I love that part of the work and I'm really looking forward to that part of the work. You are the perfect fit for uh, this beautiful position that you know you are championing and, uh, you know, it's it's quite a legacy, I think, to be able to uh, carry forward uh, and to not only recognize and learn from, you know, the past, but also having that vision of what's happening presently and that, you know, ability to um, not only bring people together, the humility to listen and uh, to take notes and uh, to you know, report back and to say, okay, you know, this is, this is what's happening with this group. And, uh, you know, the, the more people will feel like that, that sense of uh, trust, you know, can be fostered again and, uh, uh, and that that credibility can be restated. And then, you know, as a result, I think it will be an even stronger movement, you know. Uh, that's really neat. So we're going to take a very quick break mm -hmm. and be right back. Sure. Hi, my name is Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review, coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, right here in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Asian Review is the oldest of the 35 or so shows um, uh, broadcast by ThinkTech Hawaii. We've been in production since 2009. 
Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with information, breaking information about events in Asia. Asia being anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan, from the Russian uh, Far East south to Australia and New Zealand. We hope to see you every Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. Hey, aloha, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii, uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Contemo, and we're back with Kara. So, Kara, um, in our previous segment, we were talking about all of these amazing things that the Commission, you know, is faced with, not only in terms of um, plans and, and invitations, you know, to grow, to regroup, and, and it's being resurrected, you know, after a while where, you know, you had a really hard time, and uh, I'm really excited. So, uh, to talk about, uh, you know, the work that it's being done right now at the legislature, you know, level. So, we could, you know, cover a little bit of, you know, where things are at. So. Would you like to start with Title IX? <laughs> sure, I'd like to start yeah. with Title IX. It's a great opening. Um, so Title IX is the capital T federal civil rights legislation that prohibits sex discrimination. That includes sexual harassment and sexual violence on campuses, so in schools that receive any, mm -hmm. uh, or programs that receive federal funding. Right. So we have a unique legacy in Hawaii because that legislation was championed by Patsy Mink, the late. Um, Patsy Mink. And so we want a state version of Title IX, not just because of what's happening at the federal level, which is a threat to mm -hmm. um, this particular legislation, right. but also because students don't have a place to go right now at mm -hmm. the state level. And in fact, under current law, employees have greater protections against sexual harassment than students. Yeah. I was so shocked to learn that. I uh, came across the bill that was introduced uh, uh, in, uh, in Hawaii this year, and I had this assumption that it, it was following you know, a federal trend, and uh, it was like unbelievable to me. So where are things at uh, with this bill in Hawaii right now? So good news and bad news, or bad news and good news. Would you like to start with the bad news Let's first? start with the bad news. <laughs> yes. so, the legislation that was crafted um, with everybody at the table, unfortunately, has died. So our initial vehicles have um, not moved forward in the process. Mm -hmm. But we still have a bill, carryover bill, that was recently resurrected. Um, I hate introducing a bunch of bill numbers because they're really dry mm -hmm. for folks, mm -hmm. but it's HB 1489. Okay. Yeah. So it, it lives on, and we're now using that as the primary vehicle for this legislation. And I think it's really important because just a week ago, we saw in the, or this week actually, we saw in the Star Advertiser a 16-year-old student, Kenzie Ozoa, who wrote this incredibly articulate and brave piece describing witnessing her, how her school protected rapists and essentially is whitewashing sexual assault as bullying and how unacceptable this is. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a, a lot of different high profile um, news about the failures of the Department of Education to comply. Right. Title IX passed in 1972, so it's had almost 50 years to comply. Mm -hmm. And compliance is very different from having a process of accountability through effective enforcement. Exactly. And uh, so, um not wanting to be controversial, but wanting to bring a little bit of spin in that. So, uh, 45 years has passed since Title IX was passed, uh, you know, in the United States at the federal level. Why do you think Hawaii is having such a hard time with compliance? I think this has to do with the title of our program, um, Mainstreaming Feminism, because we know that 
just injecting women into government or into processes or putting something on the books isn't enough. We can't just add things on paper or add women into these institutions and stir. It doesn't work like that. We need a commitment against sexism, the system of sexism in Hawaii. And we're still entrenched in that system, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, it's met, been met with a lot of obstruction. So it's been intentionally obstructed. But not only that, it's the culture, too, that we're talking about. And so, yes, so there is a lot of education and unlearning to be done in the upcoming years until we can have this fully mm -hmm. implemented and, and the accountability is in place also for it to happen. So, OK, Title IX, what is the next legislation you would you like to cover? Well, I feel torn in prioritizing some of them because we have so many great advocates and all of these bills are equally important in terms of uplifting women collectively. Um, one of the big ticket items is paid family leave. Yes. You know, uh, Hawaii, as part of the United States, is a dubious outlier. Mm -hmm. I was at a rally recently that we hosted um, along with some Day. community groups. And what I said at that rally was that Mother's Day is my least favorite holiday as a mother. Because if, if Hawaii honored women, it wouldn't be this hard mm -hmm. to have paid maternity and paternity leave. Right. And so we're really close this year. You know, it, it's I absolutely do not take any credit for this effort. It has been. Uh, the former executive director, Kathy Betts, pushing it um, just tirelessly and working with a lot of different stakeholders, oh. um, and particularly women on the ground, mm -hmm. to get this done. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that this is the year for that. Me too, you know. And uh, so for uh, our viewers who would like to follow the status of what's happening with all of these bills and would like to also be involved uh, not only during legislative season, but throughout the year, mm -hmm. what would be your advice for them? <laughs> like There's, how do they access all of this and get engaged? Well, it's not women's issues. I think, first of all, we need to do away with that notion because it's mm -hmm. women who are part of our lives. Almost, yes. I mean, we were created by women. Um, so this is something that we need to talk about in terms of how we're not valuing women. And the best way to do that, I think, is to either reach out to us with your particular interest. We have many different platforms. We're on Instagram, Status of Women Hawaii. We're on Facebook. We also can, of course, be called to get involved with um, either legislation or training programs. Uh -huh. So we launched a Me Too prevention training which I'd really love um, folks to learn more about. So let's talk about Me Too, not only as a movement, but the training that is being implemented here in Hawaii. OK. Yeah, I'm excited about it because it's a, it's a new model. There are other training programs. Of course, there's mandatory sexual harassment in certain workplaces. Mm -hmm. But those work off of a legal framework and about pursuing justice through criminalization or civil sanctions. And occasionally, some of them are a little bit broader and talk about maybe healthy, healthier behaviors or strategies. But they never take a panoramic view of what we're participating in and why those conditions are still so disfavorable to women. Mm -hmm. So this training, in particular, focuses more on the culture that we are creating. We hear this big word, patriarchy. It's a buzzword. Mm -hmm. It's been all over our feeds this past year, thanks to feminist activists. Yeah. But understanding that we are patriarchy and how to unlearn that. Exactly. And that, you know, and like, you know, like, what does it look like and what it smells like, you know, and uh, how are we propagating that? Even when we don't think we are not, I think part of the awareness and being able to have these candid dialogues, you know, is very important, you know, and not just with women, but, you know, with everyone in the community, all ages, you know, all, all genders, and uh, check our biases, because we all have implicit biases, even we don't acknowledge that, but we do. And how are we going to be able to change it, you know, if we're not able to really have this platform that's safe, direct, you know, educational, where people can really come forward and say, all right, you know, here's what I know. And, you know, like, you can be uh, given more food for thought 
and that exchange can continue to happen. You know, so that's, this is really exciting. And uh, um, so, uh, so like, w what has been the response like for me to, from your perspective, uh, when you started being involved uh, with the community? organizing and hearing the voices of individuals here in Hawaii and, and where uh, did these trainings and dialogues have happened in our island so far? So the response has been really encouraging because I think that there were activists and activist groups where women could go with their anger and where men could go with their empathy. Mm -hmm. So there are those outlets here and one of them was that training. And so the response has been, we can no longer pretend that we don't know sexism is a normal part of everyday life for the majority of women. We're beyond that now. Um, we see the wall of silence. It has been exposed. Um, that huge wall that women can't even get to due process or get to any justice until we chip away at that wall. So there's this advance, this collective advance to level the wall that I'm so encouraged by. Mm -hmm. And um, I've personally trained everyone from the Office of the Prosecuting Attorney on Kauai to the National Association of Social Workers with this training. Um, we've been reached out to by folks um, in the legal world as well as many different classrooms at UH and programs. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's just a way to approach an uncomfortable topic because it's so personal. Gender is just so personal to all of us, and so right. it feels really threatening. But this is not, of course, a fix-all, but it's a start of broadening the conversation because I think there's still a lot of fear. Oh, yes. And uh, so we have um, one minute left, and uh, I wanted to ask you, if you could uh, elaborate to our viewers, you know, one thought uh, of uh, help and encouragement for those who are still struggling with the fear, mm. and one word of encouragement for those who are in the trenches, you know, doing this and feeling like they're banging their heads against the wall, but, you know, still keep going because like, this is not a new movement, you know. I think women's mm. rights has been something that's been fought across the globe for centrist you know so I love yeah I love that thought that feminism started when the first woman said that she's not going to accept her status in the role given to her by patriarchy I think that we need to find courage and hope in the fact that it is just it is just starting we're putting so much weight on ourselves like why haven't we fixed 4,000 years of being subordinated and that's because we're just starting and we've done so much already. So there's so much hope in that. And I'm just one tiny piece of a long line of women. And women in front of me are gonna continue that. And we have to do it for them. We have to create a bigger platform so that they can go higher. And the women living in fear right now know that there are women ready to stand with you. There are women publicly stand with you, not just as a support network um, to heal through what you've gone through, but there are ways where you can get support, whether it's legally or in another way that's more, um, that's more appropriate to finding a sense of collective justice. And I'm really happy about that. Feminism is the coolest. It's the best. I think that um, the future isn't female. The future is feminist if we're going to have a future at all. And I think that people are going to really understand this the more we go forward and become closer and more healthy and stronger as a result. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I could not have said it better. I hope you come back to our program many times throughout the years and uh, that we can give continuity to what we just have started here. Thank you so very much. And uh, this concludes uh, another episode of Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you very much for watching us and uh, we hope.